Hi there. There's been no shortage of lab projects using LoRaWAN, but it's time to move these low bitrate use cases into production. In this webinar, Kevin Holcomb shares some solid LoRaWAN use cases that are ready for production. Here's Kevin. Okay, so we're going to go over LoRaWAN from a couple of different perspectives. Um, the first thing we'll do is talk about, you know, what is LoRaWAN? How does it work? What are the different components of the architecture? And then we'll go into some, some use cases specific to mining, right? And these will be use cases we've either seen implemented or that we've thought of. And I'd love in the chat as we're going through this, if there's if we show a use case where it's something you're like, oh, we don't need that. We've got that covered already. Or if you think of ones we don't present, uh, please do mention those because um, that, that that helps us as well on this side when we're uh, building our, our products and solutions. And then finally, after we know what LoRaWAN is, and we go over some use cases. We'll show a um, a way that Cisco is, has created that makes LoRaWAN a little, little easier to deploy, like a, a quick out-of-the-box uh, method to use LoRaWAN. Um, without the end user actually having to understand everything about LoRaWAN. Okay, so the first part is, you know, what what is LoRaWAN? So it, it's it's an unlicensed spectrum, uses unlicensed spectrum, right? It'll be either the 800 or the 900 megahertz ISM band, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, and of course, it's it's unlicensed, um, it's scalable, it's it's really easy and low cost to do a deployment, right? You throw up a gateway, there's no um, license issues you have to get or or um, um, you know, getting regulatory bodies to give you access to spectrum or anything like that. It's just a pure ISM band. Um, long coverage, right? So you're going to get kilometers of coverage. You know, typically rule of thumb will usually say 15 kilometers in a rural environment. You know, you go into a, like a, a more dense urban environment, you're probably getting around two, something like that, depending on lots of buildings and things to go through in that case. Um, one gateway can literally cover, you know, can, can handle thousands of sensors, right? So you get a lot of density of coverage there. Now, the thing with LoRaWAN is it's not for streaming video or file transfers or anything like that, right? It, it's really low bandwidth. It's for little pieces of information that happen every once in a while. So maybe I'm getting a temperature reading every 15 minutes, or I'm getting a vibration reading once an hour, or a, maybe a location, a piece of location data every 15 minutes. That's the kind of data we're looking at here. So, you know, it, it's probably not really in your control um, network. It's probably more in, in your monitoring uh, for the most part. You're know, thinking of it in, in the perspective of a mining use case. And then the benefits you get from that low, low data rate, you get really low power consumption, right? So you've got sensors out there um, that can be battery powered and can last, you know, 10 years out there before the batteries need to be changed. So, you know, you get your low data rate on one side, it's for a little piece of information, but the benefit you get is the long range and the long battery life. Okay, so Ian showed this this very same slide. You know, in the last presentations, he was covering the Wi-Fi and the BLE blocks here, uh, and in this session, we'll be covering the LoRaWAN one down in the the lower right there. So LoRaWAN, it, it kind of fills gaps. You know, all wireless technologies have have a place. They have a place where they shine, right? And then they have a place where um, maybe another technology is better than, than a given technology. So I like to think of LoRaWAN as kind of filling in some gaps from some other technologies. So, you know, you're, you're not going to get the high bandwidths of Wi-Fi or cellular, but you're going to get really long range and you're going to get long battery life, right? So LoRaWAN fits down there in the, the lower right of, of that diagram. Okay, as far as use cases, we'll show a couple in a few minutes that are specific to mining, but um, it's use cases for LoRaWAN are pretty broad, right? We got, we got, you can use it in manufacturing, mining, of course, smart cities, monitoring air quality, parking, you know, all around the city, uh, warehouse and logistics, ports, refineries, utilities. I mean, it's, it's pretty wide and there are sensors out there for just about everything you can think of. Um, so that's, you know, that's where LoRaWAN, these are the kind of places that you would see LoRaWAN used, broadly speaking. We will deep dive into a couple specific to mining in a few minutes, though. Okay, so Cisco has been in the in the LoRaWAN business for a long time. Um, we were one of the, the initial members, right, right when LoRaWAN was first rolling out. Um, so that was probably around 2015, 2016, somewhere around there. Um, you know, we're a founding member of the LoRa Alliance. That's the body that works to kind of standardize LoRaWAN and um, you know, 
pretty broad global global organization. So since the time when Cisco started with LoRaWAN, um, you know, we've grown to over 500 customers in, in over 60 countries now. So we've got a lot of experience with deploying LoRaWAN. Um, so we've been in it for, for a long time. Okay, so this is what your, your general uh, LoRaWAN architecture looks like, right? In kind of a simplified form, All right? So you have your endpoints, that could, that's your sensors, right? They could be battery powered or they could be wired. It depends. Right. Um, and they're going to do, they're going to payload, they're going to measure and they're going to encode the data. Right. And then you got a gateway and that's, that's basically going to convert what comes over the air to IP. That's the main purpose of a gateway. And then you have the network server, which I would, I would call the, the brain of the operation. Right. So the LoRaWAN network, the network server is the brain. So it would be similar to like a wireless LAN controller and Wi-Fi or maybe, um, call manager for collaboration, right? So it's, it's the device that's figured out, you know, who can get on the network, which gateways can get on the network, which sensors can get on the network. It, it parts of the network server negotiate session keys, right? So the data that goes over there can be um, securely encrypted. Um, it does deduplication uh, because that's you know, with LoRaWAN. LoRaWAN is a little different than Wi-Fi, whereas you, uh, you know, in Wi-Fi, I'll, I'll use like an 802.11, uh, 2.4 gigahertz as an example. You know, if you're walking through a building, you might have the first one on channel one, the next AP on channel six, and the next one on channel 11, right? And you're, as you walk through the building, you're kind of hopping from one AP, you know, going to the best AP. So with Wi-Fi, you'll typically set up all your gateways with the same channel plan. And so all, all the sensors that are out there, they're just putting out messages into the air. And any gateway that's around that can hear those messages will do so. And it will, because they're all the gateways are listening on the very same channels. They're going to forward that to the network server and the network server figures out, oh, I've seen this message already, right? So it does the deduplication in the network server. And then the network server can forward data out to your applications, right? For visualization or, or further analysis. So these are the, at a high level, this is the general architecture of, of LoRaWAN. And we'll we'll go into each one of these in a little bit, a uh, couple of slides here. Okay, so the first part we'll go to is for, for Cisco, we make some gateways, right? So we have the IXM gateway there on the right, or sorry, on the left. That's the, that's the IP67 outdoor rated gateway. And then we have a new product that's just coming out imminently. And that's a pluggable module for our, our, our IR1101 router. Right, so the IR1101 is fully modular, and we'll have a pluggable module now that you can uh, plug inside that, turn that router into a LoRaWAN gateway. So a little deeper dive on each one of those products. So for the, the gateway, uh, we typically see it mounted on poles or on rooftops. For We call this one the IXM. Um, it's, really, it's very rugged, IP67. Um, you can do dual antennas for received diversity if you want to do that. And... Um, that one, we, we do see it sometimes indoors as well. Uh, if, you're, if you're in like a harsh uh, industrial type of environment, we'll also see this one indoors. But but definitely pole top, rooftop, towers, it's a great gateway for that. And then uh, the 1101 PIM, the pluggable module, um, that's, you know, it's, it's a little module that will actually plug into the 1101. So the nice thing about this is the 1101 also has a family of cellular uh, modules you can plug in. So now you can take this single box here and you can do a cellular backhaul right there from this same device. You can plug the LoRaWAN pluggable module in. So now you've got LoRaWAN going out, you got cellular backhaul, and then you can also host applications on it, right? So you can run small applications on the, uh, all on the same device there. And that's fully rugged as well. That's a DIN rail mount device. So you'll, you typically have that inside a cabinet you know, depending on how harsh the environment is, um, you'd have that, you know, mounted inside a cabinet. Then you'd have the antenna, you know, outside the cabinet for, for your lower win. Okay, now the piece we, so we didn't cover yet is the network server piece. So when it comes to the network server, remember the network server is, is the brain of a lower win network, right? So the uh, for the network server, um, Cisco, uh, we resell a network server from a company called Actility. They call it Thing Park Enterprise. So we resell that. We also support something we call Common Packet Forwarder, 
which allows the, the gateway to interoperate with a lot of other network server vendors that are on the market as well. Okay, so that would be, you know, if you're doing the, the I call it the build your own approach where, you know, thinking back to that diagram we looked at a few minutes ago, you pick your own sensors, you pick your gateway, hopefully a Cisco gateway, you pick your own network server and you pick your own applications, right? And you put all this together. So that's one way to consume LoRaWAN. That's one way to implement it. Um, and then in a few more slides after this, I'm going to show you something that we've done here at Cisco where we kind of put all of that diagram that we saw earlier with those four different pieces. We put that all under the Cisco umbrella and kind of take out some of the complexity uh, and what I'd call a science project out, out of, um, you know, LoRaWAN deployments. Okay, so let's think about some use cases specific to mining. So uh, one big one we've seen implemented before and, and you know thought about even more is, is asset tracking, right? So just general asset tracking. So tracking things like light plants or comms trailer, right? Like if you have a comms trailer, maybe um, maybe it has to be powered down to, to be moved, to be ro relocated. And you know maybe when it gets relocated, Somebody forgets to turn the power back on and now you can't find it, right? So even though the comms trailer probably does have GPS on it natively, if the power's not there, maybe you can't locate it, right? So it's kind of a nice out of band way. Just throw a little uh, sensor on there, throw a gateway or two up around the mine, and now you can know where your, your comms trailers are. Um, same power skids, you know, you could track some service vehicles or safety trucks, um, restroom facilities. Or if you have those scattered around a site and, and might misplace them sometimes, um, you know, and I throw a little sensor in there. GP, usually they make GPS sensors for, for LoRaWAN. So it's GPS on one side, gets a fix from the satellites, back calls that over LoRaWAN. All right. So you can get those. And then just general th theft prevention, right? You can draw geofences and you can know if something moved outside the geofence, or you can even be notified if it moves at all. Like maybe you have something that's not supposed to move. And if somebody tries to move it, you, you know, you want a notification that, that it's been moved. Um, another good one is, you know, air quality monitoring. And, and again, um, let us know in the chat. I see a couple ideas there coming in. If there's other things, you know, in these categories that we missed or other things you can think of, uh, please do let us know. So another one um, we've seen implemented is, is air quality monitoring. Right, so that could be you know particulate matter, SO2, CO2, and that could be done for a number of reasons. Could be regulatory compliance. It could be you know proof so that you can get tax incentives, and, and also you know for worker safety. Right, just making the the mine a safer place to um, to work. Another one is uh, is cable management. Right, so this this particular sensor is made by Pygo, and it's used to manage the location of trailing cables. Right, and to monitor those for not just location, but also for shock, and you know the energy status. So is, is current going through this uh, through this wire or not? So that's another good use case. And again, you you throw up a couple of lower wing gateways, and you've covered this entire gigantic space. Um, vibration monitoring, right? So maybe if you, I know a lot of a lot of conveyor systems already have built-in monitoring, but maybe you have a, a legacy conveyor system that doesn't have built-in vibration monitoring, um, or also just miscellaneous pumps and motors that are around, right? So you can do things with LoRaWAN, like you can have a smart uh, vibration sensor out there that periodically takes measurements and reports those back, right? And then you can try to you know, do preventative maintenance or no, you know, know when a failure is gonna happen before, uh, before it actually happens and impacts production. Okay, and this is a good catch-all, like physical security, just, you know, maybe you have a, an out building or something or, or a storage a storage building for um, for supplies closer to the service area, right? Those kind of buildings um, that may have power, but you may not have a security system maybe, or, you know, you got a building, maybe a, a comms building, and the, the door gets left open somehow, and, um, you know, bad things can happen. Animals can come in, the weather can come in, um, so you could get notification of things like that happening. Um, it could be, you know, access to battery compartments on skids or trailers. You could just general door open, close or occupancy. Um, you want to know if somebody came into a building, maybe there may be people are normally not supposed to be there. Right. So that, that those are uh, just general physical security use cases. And the picture here, you can also see that tank out to the side. Lower when there's also tank sensors, 
right? So you can monitor tank level as well over, uh, you know, pretty far range. Okay, so now we've kind of seen what LoRaWAN is and, uh, you know, some use cases around a mine. I'm gonna show you something. This is what I alluded to earlier, where uh, that diagram we had a couple back in the beginning where we showed the architecture. This is all of that diagram under one umbrella, right? So we call this uh, Cisco Industrial Asset Vision. And that's where we have sensors that, that we, they're Cisco sensors. Um, you have our, our gateway, and then there's a cloud managed application. Um, so there's nothing to install on prem. I know that may not work everywhere, right? The, the fact that it's cloud, but um, you know, for places where it, it, it does work, um, you have this cloud managed dashboard. So everything, you don't have to install any servers. When we push new features down, you don't have to um, install anything or it's, you know, the new features just magically, magically appear. So it's, that's the real goal of it is to make it so that the way we looked at it with asset vision is the customer has assets and the, and the customer wants uh, data about those assets and they don't really want to know, have to be an expert on LoRaWAN. We don't want to have to get console cables out. None of that. It's just like, I've got stuff. I want to monitor my stuff. How's what's the fastest way I can do that. Right. And how do I maintain it at scale once I've got lots of sensors out there? So we do use LoRaWAN. Our sensors use LoRaWAN, but we try to uh, craft the solution offering in such a way that you don't necessarily have to be an expert on LoRaWAN. In fact, that network server piece, that's the brain of a LoRaWAN network, um, you never interface with that. That's all abstracted away. And so when you, you do things like um, onboard sensors, it's all based on a mobile device. You scan a QR code and, um, and that's it. Scan a QR code, turn the sensor on, it's reporting data. So, you know, looking at the, the cloud side, um, the main advantages of this are you have single pane of glass, look at, look at your, all your assets and locations. And we have some, some simple reporting, uh, flexible alerting. So you can draw geofences. You can be alerted when something leaves a, a geofence. Um, if your temperature goes too high, your vibration gets too high, anything like that, you can be alerted through, through email and on a mobile. And we also have role-based access. So if you, uh, I'll show you in a second, I'll actually show, show what that looks like in the actual dashboard. Okay, so everything deploys in minutes, and that, that goes for the gateway itself all the way to the sensors. So as, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's all based on a scan with a mobile device, so even the gateways. So you, you, scan a, um, you scan a barcode on the back of the gateway, as long as the gateway can reach the cloud, and the ports are open and everything, um, the right configuration gets pushed down automatically. Um, same for sensors. Um, you know, we, we ship the, the sensors. Most of our sensors are battery powered with one exception. And all those that are battery powered ship with the batteries installed. So it's literally like you pull a new sensor out of the box, you onboard it, you've got data flowing in about 30 seconds. And um, the other beauty of this is the data doesn't have to stay within Asset Vision. We can publish the data out through MQTT, for instance, or Azure IoT Hub. And uh, then you can pull it into your existing workflow or you know business applications. Okay, I wanted to deep dive on these, the next two sensors in particular. Um, so today we have 12 sensors. I'll show you more about those in a minute, but there are two in particular that are new that I think have, um, you know, more applicability to mining. So the first one is the AV400, and that's an, we call that the industrial sensor bridge. So the idea with this is we know that there are a lot of industrial sensors out there that Cisco would never make, right? So pressure high steam pipe, you know, if you want to monitor that, or you want to monitor the, the tank level of some corrosive material like Cisco, that's not really our, our business, right? So we're not going to make those kind of sensors, but there are vendors out there that make those very specialized sensors. And, um, you know, a lot of times they're running four to 20 milliamps or zero to one to five volts, uh, something like that. And so our idea was we'll make it easy now to get that data in, right? So you can use the sensors, the third-party sensors that you already own, uh, you know, four to 20, zero to 10, whatever it might be. And now you connect those into our bridge and now periodically, 15 minutes by default, uh, we're gonna sample those and we back all that over LoRaWAN. So now you can get remote visibility into that data. 
So we have four analog inputs on the device, uh, two for 4 to 20 milliamps, and then we have two that are set up for voltage. And then there are two digital inputs. So anything that like a, a wet or dry contact closure, you know, those types of events, you can monitor those with the digital input and we can get remote access to that. Um, this is the one earlier when I mentioned they're all battery powered. This is the one exception. So this one, because we know the 4 to 20 milliamp loop, for instance, or those external sensors, they're going to be powered anyway by something. So we just let this also be powered by that same power source, right? So this one you put out in the field, you never have to worry about batteries because presumably there's a power source there anyway. So let's go ahead and use that. Um, it's industrial rated. This one's IP66, a wide operating temp. And this one has an external antenna. This is the only sensor we have. All the others are, are internal antennas, but this one um, has the external antenna. That's in case you put it inside a cabinet or something. It makes it easy to get the antenna out. So that one we, we feel like will open up a lot of use cases because there's 4 to 20 milliamp sensors for everything. And then the other new one is the AV251. That is a vibration sensor. So um, these we report on per axis, X, Y, Z, right? We can do acceleration, RMS, and peak. We can do velocity, RMS, displacement, um, and several statistical derivations. Now, the cool thing about this sensor is, because remember, LoRaWAN is for small payloads, right? It's, it's really low, low bandwidth. But vibration monitoring is actually quite complex, right? You're going to wake up, and you're going to take a lot of measurements in the time domain, and then you have to convert that to something that is suitable to go over LoRaWAN. Right. So you're not going to like if we wake up and take 800 samples in the time domain per axis, uh, we wouldn't be able to send all 800, uh, 2400 samples all over the air on LoRaWAN. So there's edge processing that happens inside this sensor and, and calculates all of those. You know, some of these are in the frequency domain right? and it's going to it's going to do the conversions and it reports just the summary, the summary data over LoRaWAN. So now when it gets to you in the cloud, you can start to look at. You know what's normal for this sensor it's usually maybe the velocity rms is normally at a certain level and all of a sudden it gets higher than that all right you can do it that way and get an alert um, another way to look at it is you know, there's iso specs out there that um, that specify if you have this horsepower of machine mounted in this way the velocity rms should not be higher than this right there's different zones there's like the green zone everything's okay there's a yellow zone where it's like okay you can still run this machine, but go check on it when you get a chance. And then there's a red zone where it's like, don't even operate this machine anymore. All right. So you can also do that would be an even simpler way of doing monitoring. It's just knowing what you put that sensor on and setting those those firm thresholds there, you know, based on an ISO spec. So this another cool thing about this, it has a, a temperature sensor in the base. Right. So you can pick up those kind of machine failures like a lubricant gets old or it's, it's gone. And uh, the machine starts to heat up or, you know, bearing uh, gets damaged and causing friction and causes heat. Um, we also have a, a magnetic base for this sensor. So, you know, we have a couple ways to mount it. One is you can use epoxy. Uh, another way is just a stud mount if there happens to be a, a hole, the corresponding hole in the machine. Uh, and the other way is just the magnet mount. So it's a pretty strong magnet. And uh, you can put the magnet mount on the bottom of the sensor and, you know, it's, as long as the, the motor is ferromagnetic, uh, you can attach it that way. So that, that's another new sensor that, that we have. And let me, uh, for a few minutes here, we'll go over, I'll show you the actual dashboard. Okay, so, so one other thing I should mention before I forget, the sensors that we sell at Cisco Sales with Industrial Asset Vision are only for Industrial Asset Vision. So we don't sell those for use outside of industrial asset vision. Like if you wanted to use it, for instance, with just generic LoRaWAN, kind of the build your own solution, um, we, we don't sell it in that way. So because industrial asset vision is kind of a curated uh, solution, full stack solution. So it's our sensors, our gateway um, and our, our cloud app um, all working together. Right. So a couple of things I mentioned uh, earlier, I would show the, the role based access control. Right. So you can create in here in the cloud, you can create these different levels of your hierarchy, depending however you want to. It could be geographical. It could be based on business role, anything. Um, you can create that how you want. And then you can create what's called an access control group. And you can say put certain people or certain groups of people in the access control group 
and they only have access to certain levels of the hierarchy, right? So you can kind of control who can see what um, through here as well. And then I won't go too deep into it, but uh, I'll show you a couple of the, the high points. So, you know, some things that might apply to, to mining, uh, the location. So we, we have, we have a, a sensor that is a GPS location sensor. It's this one right here, the AV300. Right, so that's going to monitor. It just looks for GPS. Right, it looks for the satellites periodically, um, derives GPS fix and uplinks that over LoRaWAN. And if we want to see how that might look, let's look at assets. Let's go down here to field assets. We've got a truck out there, and um, let's see what the location of that truck is. So we can go into tracking, and then we can see where the truck is. Right, and see a, a little breadcrumb trail of of where that that truck has been. So we can do that kind of thing. Um, the other one that's a nice sensor to look at, I'll show you that vibration sensor, the kind of data that comes off of that. So if we've got, I think it's under facilities. Yeah, so on the roof of one of the Cisco buildings, we've got a, a chiller pump. And um, so we've, we've had a vibration sensor up there for almost a year now. And um, so here's all the kinds of data you can get off of that. So you can see velocity, RMS, you know, acceleration peak per axis, right? You're seeing it in all axes, axes. And then you get all those uh, statistical derivations down here, right? Crest factor and kurtosis and skewness and deviation. You can get all that as well. Um, now, let's say you wanted that data. You wanted to export that data because you wanted to show it to somebody else or maybe somebody who's not an asset vision user. Um, you can get that as well. You can get it in, in a tabular form. Right, so you can also get the data in a tabular form there, and you can export it to a CSV. And then the other sensor I'll show you is the, the 4 to 20 milliamp bridge. So if we go back to our hierarchy, I have a bridge here. So that's the bridge device. And I'll show you the, something cool we did. Um, so we, you know, 4 to 20 milliamp sensor, 4 milliamps will mean something, and 20 milliamps mean something. Right, like it wouldn't be very useful to tell somebody 7.6 milliamps. They're like, what does that mean, right? What, what's the tank level? What's the temperature? What, what, what's, uh, what does 7.6 mean? So what we do here is, is when you create one of these sensors, um, I'm going to delete this one, and I'll show you what it looks like if we add a new one for air quality. So you actually put the transformation in Asset Vision. So you can put what does 4 milliamps mean, what does 20 milliamps mean, and when you, Asset Vision shows you that data, like for instance, if we had a furnace temperature, like we have temperature sensors in Asset Vision, but they don't go to like the temperature of a furnace, right? So you might use a four to 20 milliamp sensor and you know, you're know you going up to like a thousands of degrees, a thousand degrees. And um, so here you'll see the actual temperature, right? And this hasn't changed very much. This is all, this is an emulator, but um, I haven't changed, moved the dial in a while. But uh, so that you actually get the real data, the actionable data that you can do something with, right? And not to, you know, not um, 7.6 milliamps. Um, now we do show you that if you wanted to see it in tabular form, there's the raw data. In this case, it's 13.5 milliamps. It translates to 7, 16.45 Fahrenheit in this case. Um, if we look back at the way that you do this, uh, did you set up this transformation? So let's go to inputs. Let's take this analog input four, which is a voltage device. And let's say that we're going to make this an air quality. We're going to monitor air quality with this. So we'll just call it air quality. We know this is a voltage input because remember the device physically has two current inputs and two voltage inputs. So let's say it's air quality. So the output unit is uh, going to be uh, probably concentration. So let's say it's parts per million, something like that. We'll say, okay, if I see zero volts, let's just for fun, let's make this a one to five volt sensor. So one volt might mean uh, zero parts per million, and maybe five volts means, let's say, 130 parts per million. And uh, we can either assign that to an asset or we can just put it in the organization hierarchy somewhere. So in this case, I'm going to drop it under the bridge demo area of the org hierarchy, and we do add. And so when I come back here now, I can see, oh, there's my transform. I just created one volt means zero parts per million. Five volts is 130. And now whenever this actually starts to report, you get the real actionable data, right, that you can actually act on um, and not have to do the translation. So the other part I'll, I'll, I'll leave. Yeah, Kevin, there's a couple of questions that came up that I'm wondering if we need to talk to um, yeah. uh, with the group. Um, 
Is there alarming that you can create directly out of this? And how do you, who do you notify? I see an alert section there. There is, so you can create alarms. So you can go into alerts, you can create these rules, right? So in this case, I've got different things like the, the motor vibration too high. Um, and then you can look in, so you can create in the alert. The way we did it is an alert is just a rule that stands by itself. It doesn't notify anybody on its own. It's just okay. a statement, right? It's like vibration too high or temperature too high and a threshold. That's all it does natively by itself. But what you do is you create a template. And now when you get into the template, the template is where you say, here's the rule that I want to attach. And here's all the people that I want to notify. And you can even put multiple uh, rules. Okay. Yeah, you can do multiple rules because you can do like an escalation path where like maybe if, if if the temperature gets to this level, I notify somebody. If it keeps rising more, I notify somebody else, right? And um, the, the benefit of that is when you go out to install that device with the mobile app, you don't have to remember all the rules. You don't have to remember who gets notified in which way. Is it email? Is it SMS? You just remember, oh, when I install a sensor on this type of motor, I'm always supposed to use this template and all of that information um, magically gets pushed to the, the sensor. Yeah, so that, that's how we create the alerts. Hope you enjoyed this presentation from Kevin. For more information on Cisco and the mining industry, check out cisco.com slash go slash mining. Take care.